On the 1st of May 2021, JXC released a video called The Fall of Doctor Who. At the time of recording, it has over 3.5 million views and is a five-hour critique of the Whitaker Chibnall era of Doctor Who. Well, series 11 and 12. From the offset, a lot of fans were hesitant to watch a video like this. Thankfully, the entire video essay is incredibly well thought out and really does go into detail on some of the shortcomings of the Chibnall era. Anyway, it's been two years exactly-ish since Jay's original video and a lot has happened to the show. And I mean a lot. Doctor Who seems to be heading in a very exciting and unexpected trajectory. So because of this, I asked Jay, hey, could I make a sort of epilogue to your video? And this is what they said. Hey, Jay, um, I was wondering if I could make that Rise of Doctor Who video? No, Crispy. No! Oh, really? Nah, I'm kidding. Of course. Go for it. Be my guest. Cool, thanks. And with that being said, welcome to the rise of Doctor Who. Hello, I'm Crispy, by the way, and I make videos about Doctor Who. And if that sounds good to you, hey, why not consider subscribing, pretty please? I'm not sure how long this video will go for, but I think it's gonna be a whopper. So I'm sure I would have left some time cards, but regardless, it's a fun watch the whole way through. And in this video, we have some very special guests making an appearance, so keep an eye out for them. But anyway, the rise of Doctor Who. Well, for something to rise, first it must... Now, a lot of people think that the fall of Doctor Who started with this guy. In January of 2016, Chris Chibnall was announced to be the next showrunner following Stephen Moffat. Chibnall had previously worked on the show writing episodes in both David Tennant's and Matt Smith's tenure and was heavily involved in the early Torchwood stuff. Yes, the early Torchwood stuff. Bruh. Don't worry, I won't spend too much time on this. I'm just providing some context before we get into the exciting stuff. Good. Could you hurry up, please? I've already made a video on this. Jay, you're still here? Yeah. That's right. Uh, all right, let's summarize those points now. <clears throat> Chris Chibnall cast Jodie Whittaker in July of 2017, and then series 11 aired in October of 2018, and then chaos ensued. The first episode of series 11, The Woman Who Fell to Earth, debuted with impressive viewing figures. Jodie Whittaker's Doctor Who debut was watched by more than 8 million people and beat the introductory episodes for both Matt Smith and Peter Capaldi's Doctors. It was event television and it was a bloody exciting time. That episode still holds a special place in my heart. I, I really like that episode. The direction looked great. It felt very cinematic. Jodie's Doctor was crushing it in Peter's old outfit. These new characters really intrigued me. This episode promised a season that we didn't get and an era that we didn't get. Look, I just want to have a disclaimer now and say, on the whole, I had a great time with the Chibnall era. I think it had some standout villains, some great historical episodes, and the casting of Jodie were all highlights for me. But the main complaints that I've seen about this era was that the companions were underdeveloped, there were storytelling problems with a social edge, and the whole timeless child thing. There are some valid complaints in here. I think all of Jodie's companions deserved a bit more characterization. I mean, for goodness sake, Ryan's arc in series 12 was throwing a ball. But as a whole, I enjoyed it for what it was. Sometimes Chris Chibnall's era felt very much like Classic Who from another universe. Which was intentional because Chibnall grew up on Classic Who and absolutely loved it. Are you happy with the new series, Chris? It doesn't seem to um, have much to it. it. It hasn't improved that much since it went off the air. There are a lot more problems with the Chibnall era and I could sit here with you and talk to you for like another five hours, but someone's already made a video on that. But I don't think that the fall of Doctor Who actually started with Jodie Whittaker and Chris Chibnall. I think that the fall of Doctor Who can be traced back to the Matt Smith era of Doctor Who. What? What? According to Stephen Moffat, who took over as showrunner when Russell T Davies departed with Tennant, the BBC considered ending Doctor Who at the time. Moffat said, David owned that role in a spectacular way, gave it an all new cheeky, sexy performance and became a national treasure. So the idea that Doctor Who could go on at all in the absence of David was a huge question. I mean, David Tennant was huge and really boosted Doctor Who into the mainstream. During Tennant's tenure, Doctor Who reached the peak of its popularity amongst the general audience. The show had recently made a successful comeback with Eccleston series and Tennant's run naturally attracted a large viewership. Secondly, Tennant's reputation as a fantastic actor preceded his role in Doctor Who. 
Doctor Who, as he had already established himself in various other productions. Thirdly, his attractiveness, charm, quirkiness made him particularly appealing. And Tennant's portrayal of the Doctor was relatable and evoked sympathy from the audience due to his distinctly human qualities, which some might argue was a bad thing. It is important to remember that Doctor Who at its heart is a family show aimed at mostly a casual audience. Sure, it has some experimental episodes in there, but as a whole, David Tennant's characterization really resonated well with the casual audience. And I could not talk about Doctor Who without mentioning the word ratings. It's a terrible little word, I know. A lot of people tend to focus on Jodie's ratings and say, Doctor Who's gone down the shit. Doctor Who isn't what it used to be. Nobody watches anymore. Gosh, the ratings for Legend of the Sea Devil are terrible. They actually weren't very good. That, that was a bad one. That was really bad. But anyway. The ratings have honestly stayed fairly consistent from Matt Smith, Peter Capaldi and Jodie. Jodie's era performed about the same or slightly worse than Capaldi's and Matt Smith performed the best out of the three. But then you have to also take into consideration that the TV landscape has changed. A lot of people just watch things on streaming now. But none of these eras performed as well as the David Tennant era. The David Tennant era of the show was the gold standard for Doctor Who, a brand new age. He was the Tom Baker Doctor of the 2000s, minus the scarf. Speaking of, just on a side note, there was so much merchandise during this era and some really strange merch. Like, really, really strange. Have you seen that picture of Doctor Who merch at Toys R Us or wherever this is? You just don't see stuff like that anymore. If I want any Doctor Who merch, I'm pretty sure I can only go online. I am in Australia, though. But that just goes to show you how bloody popular this show was. So whilst a lot of people say that Doctor Who fell off five years ago, I think the same argument could be made that Doctor Who fell off, you know, 15 years ago after Russell left or however long it's been. And Russell T Davis was such a good showrunner and really brought the show back, you know? I really wish he would come back one day. Oh, wait. Russell T Davies or King Davies or Daddy T's tenure of Doctor Who has stood the test of time remarkably well from 2005 to 2010. Davies established the foundation for modern Doctor Who we know and love today, which is a significant factor in the graceful aging of this era. When he assumed control in 2005, he introduced groundbreaking elements that revolutionized the show. From self-contained episodes to overarching storylines, epic season finales, romantic TARDIS pairings, and memorable catchphrases, Davies and his team infused the series with a fresh and invigorating energy. The rewatch value of a TV series plays a crucial role in determining its longevity, and Russell T Davies' Doctor Who excels in this aspect. Davies mastered the art of crafting season-long narratives, skillfully weaving phrases and storylines throughout each season, leaving to satisfying payoffs in the finales. Some may perceive this approach as simpler compared to the complex storytelling of recent seasons. It proved to be efficient and effective in engaging audiences. Moffat had companions like Amy Pond and Clara Oswald as individuals fated to be intricately connected to the Doctor's history. But Davies focused on ordinary people such as Rose, Martha and Donna, thrust into extraordinary circumstances. Davies' emphasis on the potential of a seemingly insignificant individual to alter the universe carries particular weight and resonates deeply. Also, Davies' era subtly addressed political subtext such as the invasions of Downing Street and satirizing reality TV, and this holds added relevance in today's context. His exploration of family dynamics, including you know Rose's parallel father and the Doctor's solitary existence without his fellow Time Lords, remains timeless and continues to strike a chord with audiences. Russell T Davies' Doctor Who era has aged exceptionally well in my opinion due to its groundbreaking contributions to the show's modern framework. The enduring appeal of re-watching his seasons, the subtlety of his writing, and the timeless themes he explored just make his tenure f awesome, man. They're so good. They're so good. And that most definitely came through in award season. Since then, he has written remarkable programs like Years and Years and It's a Sin. With It's a Sin, I don't think I've cried more in a program in my life. That was, that was scarring. Highly, highly recommend. And then in September of 2021, it was announced that Russell T Davies would be returning as showrunner and the world went crazy. Twitter went absolutely wild. This, good. Thank you very much, Jay. But the general reaction was like this mostly. Oh my f God. It was a very, very exciting time, yes. This announcement generated so much enthusiasm with the fans because Davies' era is so beloved. Fans really do have a great deal of respect for Russell and it's like him taking control of the ship again, you know? 
Lord of the Rings Return of the King, you know what I'm saying? It was completely unexpected and I would not put money on it after after Chibnall. I, I could not imagine Russell T Davies coming back yet. Here I am making this video. Speaking of unexpected things, here's a special guest. So, Sean here from Who Culture, and uh, thank you very much for asking me to be a part of this video. Russell T Davies coming back. When I initially heard that he was coming back, I was delighted, but my, I remember my very first thought being like, oh, BBC are worried. Because, you know, we had Russell T, we have David Tennant coming back, we have so much of, you know, that team from 2005 coming back. And it's quite obviously an attempt to win back some of the fans that may, may have dropped off over the last while. And here's my thoughts. I am, I, I think it's a smart move and I am really looking forward to seeing what's coming. Some stuff that's been teased just looks like it's going to be a lot of fun because I think that's something that Doctor Who and, and I want to stress that it's not just the Chibnall era, but some, some of the Moffat area as well. Some of the fun got a little bit lost along the way. It was very smart writing. It was very interesting very, very interesting stories. But, you know, some of the crash buying wallop of the Russell T. Davis era is what I think really led to some of this initial success. I would like to see that energy put back into it. I think in recent years, Doctor Who has not been served well when it comes to, you know, the fun, the, you know, keeping, keeping the younger audience in mind finding that balance of, you know, that kind of cheeky stuff, the jokes for the adults, but also enough that, you know, all audiences can enjoy it. Russell T also has this way of writing that's really down to earth, even when you're off in space. And again, that's something I think is crucial to bring back because I think, funnily enough, I, I, I think the front just got a little bit lost in itself for a while. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm massively generalizing. There was some fan flipping tastic episodes and stories, you know, in all of the years since Russell T has left. That aside, that's exciting. Now the fact that he's coming back with, you know, Disney books behind him, that's cool. So it'll be very interesting to see what it looks like with this kind of a budget behind it. I'm very excited to see what sort of ongoing plot lines he includes as well. Because if there was one thing Russell T was really good at, it was the tease and the payoff. That was brilliant. She said two words to me. What were they? What were they? Bad wolf. And I mean, I, I, I don't think there, I, I don't think there was a bird left in the on the tree outside when that happened. That the screams were so loud inside. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking forward to that fun communal experience that I feel was really there with Russell T's Doctor Who. And if he can recapture any of the magic of any of those seasons, really, but, you know, Doomsday, Last of the Time Lords, uh, Stolen Earth, Journey's End, any of that, I think, will be in for a incredibly good renaissance of Doctor Who. Every time there's a new Doctor, the show is rebooted. I think we're going to both reboot and go back a little bit but I, also, I don't think he's going to repeat the greatest hits either. I think we're in a really good place with Russell T coming back. And even if he only does a couple of seasons that, you know, the guidelines, the house rules, if you like, can be set in such a way that we can recapture some of the magic that I feel has, has sort of seeped out a little bit over the last last couple of years. Thank you so much again for asking me to be a part of this. I really, really appreciate it. Keep things wibbly wobbly, everyone. And we cannot wait for the anniversary special Doctor Who to drop. Thanks. And it seems that Russell has brought back the whole crew as well. And I'm including Murray Gold in that. I mean, the two are inseparable. He's only gone and done it. Yes, that's right. Murray Gold has joined the project and will once again collaborate with the BBC National Orchestra of Wales to create some music for Doki Who. These scores will be featured in the 60th specials with David Tennant as the 14th Doctor, as well as the episodes with Shudi Gatwa as the 15th Doctor starting around Christmas. Gold previously worked with Davies on the 2005 reboot of Doctor Who, where he revamped the theme and composed new music for iconic monsters like the Daleks and the Cybermen. He's just, he's the GOAT. He is the GOAT. 
Davies has expressed his sheer delight having Gold back on board and having him back in the team is a pleasure. And speaking of the team, there is the return of the original Revival producer, Phil Collinson. Collinson was a part of the team that successfully revived the show in 2005, overcoming doubts about its relevancy in the modern era. Plus the return of Julie Gardner, this indicates a reunion of key figures of the show's successful past. During his previous tenure, Davies created a shared universe with spin-off shows like Torchwood and the Sarah Jane Adventures. With his return, there is a massive hope for the revival of spin-offs. Give me anything. I'll take class season two at this point. I don't care. But with him coming back, I feel like fans have such a wish list that they want from him. You know, they're anticipating more connections to classic Doctor Who, the return of beloved characters like Martha Jones, the implementation of clear story arcs and Doctor companion light episodes. No matter what he does, he's definitely earned his trust in my eyes, so I'm, I'm just here for the ride. All I can say is that I'm very excited for the return of Russell T Davies. Hell yeah! The GOAT is in! I said Murray was the GOAT, but Russell's the real GOAT. I mean, they're all GOATs! What's next? Bringing Catherine Tate back as Donna, David Tennant as the Doctor? Oh, wait. When this news broke, I was in complete disbelief. I I still can't believe it now, if I'm honest. We saw the announcement that both Catherine Tate and David Tennant are back for the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. <laughs> Yeehaw. Once again. Come on, there's gotta be something. Oh my gosh, okay. <gasps> oh, it's really happening. Oh my god, what the heck, what the heck, what the heck? It's all true. And when we saw the filming pictures the very next day, it's like we were being transported back to 2008. Tennant was wearing this blue new suit, he had the hair, Catherine Tate was there rocking a new outfit. What on earth is happening? And speculation went wild. A lot of people were saying, oh, this is a parallel world, or this story takes place in 2008, or this is part of a multi-doctor story. But as we saw at the end of The Power of the Doctor, David Tennant is in fact the 14th Doctor. Not some kind of forgotten Doctor or a Metacrisis, but an actual incarnation of the Doctor. Which makes this poster f***ing hilarious, by the way. I mean, look, there's two David Tennants. This show is absolutely bananas, I tell you what. But why is he back? Well, I hope this clip answers a little. Russell T. Davis and Catherine Tate and I were just sort of having a kind of text exchange. And Catherine said, wouldn't it be fun to do it again? Russell said, Whoa, we could do a one-off, maybe they'd let us. And we said, yeah, wouldn't that be a laugh? And then it all went quiet. And then suddenly Russell let us know that he was taking over the show again. And uh, would we come and play a little bit for him? So I don't know if we gave him the idea to take Doctor Who back, but certainly we thought if he's doing it, we're going to come along for a minute. And I believe Russell, David and Catherine were all in a little group chat thanks to a thing called Doctor Who Lockdown. Doctor Who Lockdown was a project initiated by Emily Cook from Doctor Who magazine during the COVID-19 pandemic. It involved online watch-along, tweet-alongs, whatever you want to call it, of Doctor Who episodes accompanied by new content created by writers, actors and fans. The project aimed to bring together fans, cast and crew to share their love for the show and provide entertainment during self-isolation. The tweet-along started with a simulcast watch-along of the show's 50th anniversary episode, The Day of the Doctor, on the 21st of March 2020. This event gained popularity, leading to more tweet-alongs being organised. Notable contributors included Stephen Moffat, Russell T Davies and Paul Cornell, who created new content such as short skits, audio stories, prequel stories, all tied to the specific episodes. On the 19th of April 2020, Catherine, David and Russell were all doing a tweet along for the Series 4 finale, The Stolen Earth and Journey's End, using the hashtag Subwave Network. This is where I think the sheer afterthought of their return was born. Now back focusing on David Tennant, when he was announced to be returning in the 60th anniversary, it was met with an overwhelmingly positive reception. But just like anything in this world, there was of course some backlash with concerns. And I will touch on that in a second, but I think, I think it was a brilliant move. After a 12 year hiatus since his tenure with the 10th Doctor ended in 2010, David Tennant is back in Doctor Who. As part of the 60th anniversary celebrations, Tennant's comeback seems fitting considering he is arguably the most beloved and recognisable Doctor of the modern era, at least to the general public. Yeah, my favourite Doctor is Peter Capaldi, but I don't think he's going to be in the 60th. But anyway, I digress. Additionally, Tennant's return coincided with Russell T Davis' return as showrunner. As we said, it's important to note that David Tennant's return is as the 14th Doctor, not reprising his role as the 10th Doctor. While Tennant's face may be familiar, this incarnation of the Doctor is distinct and could be very different. But 
most likely won't be. From my end, I feel like Doctor Who has kind of been out of the general conversation since Matt Smith left, but that just might be with me and my circles. I don't know. My love for the show has obviously never dwindled. I mean, for goodness sake, I've had this channel for 10 years. Hold on, i got to get something. I don't think it was this magazine, but anyway. But I sh you not when I went and got my three-month light copy of uh, Doctor Who magazine here in Australia. I had a conversation with the person behind the register and it went like this. Hey, can I just, uh, can I get this one pretty please? Thank you. Oh, Doctor Who magazine, eh? Yes, please. David Tennant's coming back? Yeah, well, he's like the new Doctor. Oh, really? Maybe I should get back into it. Yeah, I think you should. I stopped watching after Tenet. It, it just wasn't the same. Well, yeah, the, the same head writer's back as well. So I think you should give it a shot. Oh, maybe I will. Anyway, here's your magazine. Thank you. Bye. David Tennant. David Tennant's coming back. They fixed his hair this time. Can't really blame him for Day of the Doctor, to be honest. After all, the BBC's budget is the same seven actors, the same writers, and the same shirt. Wouldn't be surprised if they couldn't afford a tub of hair gel. I think it was a no-brainer. Tennant's return is going to unironically save the show, because his face just being on TV represents the show in its prime. I think the 60th is going to be this Trojan horse, you know, the British public sees David Tennant back on TV, you know, they say, hey, I remember him, I know that guy. They watch the 60th, they're just expecting to be there for David Tennant, but then they get roped in, they get sold on shooting that was doctor and then they're like you know what that was proper all right that was i might give this shooty bloke a chance and then bam doctor who is back david tennant's first era was very grounded despite all the weird stuff they did and that was largely thanks to russell t davies world building he made an engaging drama half of which took place in a council estate he embraced the technology of the time he used recognizable british celebrities tv shows he had that one news presenter that kept showing up multiple seasons of course moffat went for the whole fairy tale approach and you know that was an entirely different brilliant thing but i'm looking forward to a real sense of attachment to the real world i'm excited to see if they're going to try and integrate tiktok or something you know they're going to use recognizable celebrities of the time. It's either going to be really authentic or they don't stick the landing and you get something like that Ed Sheeran line. I'm a bit scared about the budget. Doctor Who's at its best when it looks a bit like crap because that puts all the power in the script. They have to outright their visual effects budget and make a story so good you don't care if it was like filmed in a cardboard box. Of course you're going to get some stinkers regardless but with newer technology there's less restraints. There might be more of a reliance on spectacle rather than substance. I do think that as bad as Covid is it might have provided some necessary restrictions in place of the budget restrictions. There are stories of Andor's production being screwed by Covid but then they worked the restrictions into the story and it forced them to come up with something even better. So maybe the same thing will happen here, who knows. Also, time. Russell has had a lot of time to write and perfect the scripts. I don't think that Chibnall is a bad writer by any means. He just had zero time to write like 10 different scripts. The first draft of anything is rubbish. That's how you make good things. But it's good to see that with the big gap between the series, no one's being rushed. All right, that was my thoughts on a uh, Tenant returning. I, d I, I don't actually think I talked about Tenant a lot, but but David Tennant won't be the only familiar face returning for the 60th anniversary celebrations. Catherine Tate will reprise her role as fan favorite companion Donna Noble. The late Bernard Cribbins will also make an appearance as Donna's grandfather, Wilfred Mott, as he had filmed scenes prior to his passing in July 2022. Jacqueline King, who portrayed Donna's mother, Sylvia Noble, will also be back, as we saw in the 60th trailers. So it seems that one of Doctor Who's most successful eras of Doctor Who is getting a kind of victory lap, or at least that's how David framed it during this Radio Times interview. The specifics of coming back to Doctor Who took a bit of wrangling but we were always receptive to the notion. Initially, it was a casual conversation going, wouldn't it be fun to do a one-off? Then Russell was back running the show and suddenly it could be something bigger. But there's really no pressure. It's a victory lap in a way. You get to do something that had meant so much to you. One last shot before you get too old to do it again. Doing a kind of soft reboot, sequel, recall uh, is a great way of attracting old viewers, much like that guy at the news agency. It's a bit of fan service for current viewers and it will attract a whole new audience for people who have been a fan of David Tennant since he left Doctor Who. He's amassed fans from Good Omens, Staged, Jessica Jones, I mean, he's all over the schedule. But of course, with anything Doctor Who, there was a bit of backlash about David Tennant being cast as the next incarnation of the Doctor. Some say David Tennant playing two different Doctors seems slightly greedy. Some feel that Tennant's return as the 14th Doctor with Russell T Davis feels like an ego-driven attempt to solidify him as the best and most definitive Doctor. The show has been criticised in the past for relying too much on fan favourites, and some say that Tennant's return seems like a desperate move instead of embracing change. 
People moan about David being in video games, comics, Family Guy, the Muppet thing, all taking away from the current Doctor. And some fans are disappointed that David Tennant's new incarnation feels way too similar to the 10th Doctor, missing an opportunity for a distinct and fresh character. And one of the biggest complaints that I've seen so far is that it detracts from Shooty Gatwa's casting. Shooty Gatwa was cast as the 15th Doctor, and some say that Tennant's return in an intermediary role takes away from Gatwa's introduction, regeneration, and smooth transition. It also overshadows the significance of Gatwa being the first male non-white Doctor. More about Shooty in a second. Well, now actually. In my opinion, this is what I'm most excited for in regards to Doctor Who's future, which is crazy considering they brought back Catherine Tate and David Tennant, but I just can't get enough of this casting decision. In May of 2022, the BBC announced that Shooty Gatwa had been cast as the next Doctor in Doctor Who, taking over from Jodie Whittaker. At the time, Shooty Gatwa was a 29-year-old actor and was born in Rwanda, raised in Scotland. Gatwa teased his casting with those damn emojis, those damn emojis, those two hearts, the plus sign and the blue box. When they first announced it, I was like, what What are we doing with these emojis? I, I don't really understand. What an underwhelming way to announce a new Doctor. I thought that the whole emoji thing was going to be just a one-off, but for every announcement in this new era of Doctor Who, they've really doubled down using these emojis, especially with their casting announcements. I think it's really cool and they're able to drive us Doctor Who fans crazy with just a few emojis. So here are some ideas that the Doctor Who marketing team can use in the future. Heart Heart plus bow tie for when they announce Matt Smith to come back, a heart heart plus police girl emoji for when Amy Pond comes back, and a heart heart plus cute monster for when they announce the 13 part Pating series exclusive to Disney Plus. But anyways, back to Shooty Gatwa and why I think it's perfect casting. Shooty Gatwa is best known for his breakout role in Sex Education, where he delivers a standout performance capturing the challenges of a British teenager trying to live their best life. His on-screen presence is captivating and even earned him the Best Actor Award at the Scottish BAFTAs in 2020. He's even garnered the attention of director Greta Gerwig and is in the Barbie movie. With all of this attention on Shooty Gatwa, he really is a rising star. As in, he ranked number one on the Radio Times TV 100 that ranks the top 100 people who changed the entertainment landscape for better in 2022. I mean, come on! Good stuff, Shooty! The chief content officer at the BBC said, He's a striking and fearless actor whose talent and energy are boundless. From what I've seen so far, no spoilers, he is going to set the world alight and take Doctor Who on extraordinary adventures where he takes charge of the TARDIS. He is also an exceptional voice for the show, being an advocate for it. When a fan was harassed online for suggesting that maybe Jonathan Groff's character in the new series of Doctor Who could be a love interest for Shooty, Shooty actually responded with this. I'm sorry you received such a horrible message from the awful guy. He's been blocked and deleted from my account. Reported him extensively. I can't stand stuff like that. Really hope you're okay. Lots of love. Shoots. It's also surprisingly refreshing having a doctor with an Instagram account, constantly sharing, liking and commenting on fan art, and even seemingly having some of that fan art in their own house. That's insane. He's also fantastic with going out and saying hi to fans while they're filming the show and just seems like a top-notch legend. And not to mention that the BBC just scored themselves a lead actor with 2.6 million Instagram followers. I just love Shooty's vibe and everything they stand for, along with the fact that they are an exceptional actor and talent. When it comes to the casting of Shooty Gatwa as the 15th Doctor, not the 14th Doctor, I'm still kind of getting used to that. It feels weird to have David Tennant play multiple numbered versions of the Doctor. It feels a bit strange. But anyway, with Shooty Gatwa, I think we've got a casting decision on the level of, say, Tom Baker from the classic series. Now, I understand that... Winnie. Winnie. You want to come up? Now, I understand that saying that comes with a lot of connotations, a lot of baggage for Doctor Who fans, because Tom Baker, along with David Tennant, are the most publicly recognisable faces of Doctor Who. In interviews and off-camera, Tom Baker was basically just the Doctor normally. Whenever he was in the BBC studios or on location in that scarf, he would just basically be playing a version of himself. 
And when it comes to Shuti Gatwa, when I see him in roles like in Barbie or in Sex Education, I see an actor who brings an awful lot of himself into every major role that he's appeared in over the past few years. That's not me saying that he can't act or that he can't go outside of his wheelhouse, of course not. I think that Shuti Gatwa, from what I've seen so far, is an outstanding actor, but it makes me wonder how much of that ethos he's going to take to the role of the 15th Doctor. There's that terrific Rolling Stone interview that Shuti Gatwa did the other month where he's talking about how he is the Doctor. Shuti Gatwa's family fled Rwanda to escape a genocide. He's grown up in Scotland and growing up there weren't many people like him. To quote Shuti when referring to the Doctor, this person fits everywhere and nowhere. I think in terms of choosing an actor to play the Doctor, Russell T Davis has done an outstanding job going younger, going for an incredibly talented young man with a real sense of style and passion for performance. You just have to watch his performance at King Charles's coronation this year where he was doing Romeo and Juliet representing Shakespeare that this guy just loves theatre. I've got a feeling that as the 15th Doctor, he's going to burn quickly because I think he might only have two seasons in him because his star has risen massively since his casting. But regardless of how long he burns for as the Doctor, he's absolutely going to burn brightly. I can't wait to see what he's got in store for us. Millie Gibson from Coronation Street will be alongside Shuti Gawa as the Doctor's assistant, Ruby Sunday. She too is a rising talent and it seems Russell is really bringing energy with these casting choices. So with David Tennant's return feeling like a little bit of weaponized nostalgia and the excellent casting of Shuti Gawa, what else is happening to make Doctor Who rise in popularity? Well... BBC and Disney Plus announced a global partnership for our lovely show, Doctor Who. As a part of a co-production deal, Disney Plus will exclusively host the show outside of the UK, expanding its availability to more than 150 countries. This move seems to align with the trend of IP becoming highly sought after by global subscription video on demand platforms, as they aim to attract and retain subscribers through loyal fan bases. When they announced this, I was like, whoa, what? Never did I ever think that Doctor Who would be in the hands of Disney. Disney? Well, kind of. Doctor Who is still like firmly on the BBC in the UK, but worldwide distribution? It, it's a Disney thing. Doctor Who's a Disney show. Sorry, sorry, just had to take over for a moment. Hello. Being Australians, I have to come to terms with the fact that the ABC will no longer have Doctor Who after 50 years or so. I find it sad because that's my whole childhood, but realistically, you know, it was only being played in standard definition in the middle of the week here. So the fact that I most likely get it quicker and in HD and I can stream it, you beauty. Disney Plus already boasts major franchises like Star Wars, Marvel and Pixar, but adding Doctor Who further enhances its content catalogue. The deal not only improves access to the show for international viewers, but also brings an increased investment for the BBC to enhance production quality. I really hope there is a tab on Disney Plus for Doctor Who, like, you know, New Who, Classic Who, and even put the spin-offs in there, you know, Sarah Jane, Torchwood, and the other one. I think the actual tab will be called The Hooniverse, especially after seeing that picture with Shooty at Bad Wolf Studios where it just says The Hooniverse. They're cooking something. They're cooking something. The comparison to Disney's acquisition of Star Wars in 2008 2012, which initially caused apprehension amongst fans, highlights the different nature of this partnership. Unlike the complete ownership of Star Wars by Disney, the Doctor Who deal is a collaboration between the BBC and Disney branded television. Disney does not own Doctor Who. Let me say that again, Disney does not own Doctor Who. Instead, it serves as a distribution partner for the series outside of the UK. This partnership is expected to generate significant revenue for the show and provide a global platform. With multiple stakeholders involved, including the BBC, production company Bad Wolf, partially owned by Sony, and Disney, there will be more hands contributing to the show. However, the most significant benefit is anticipated to come from Disney's global marketing efforts. A unified publicity drive backed by the influence of Disney Plus should be huge. There is, of course, constant talk of the possibility of spin-offs and expanding the Doctor Who universe. Russell T Davis, of course, has expressed his interest in developing related spin-off shows. Disney Plus could become the international home for these spin-offs, similar to how the platform is associated with Star Wars and Marvel content. But of course, there are some people, well, a lot of people, that are quite unhappy with how Disney have handled both their Star Wars and Marvel properties since acquiring them. 
Will the same happen for Doctor Who? Concerns about the show becoming diluted or Americanized due to Disney's family-friendly image have been raised. But to be honest, for the time being, I believe that these worries are unwarranted, given the return of Russell T. Davis as showrunner. Russell is a devoted fan of the series, and I really expect him to uphold the integrity of Doctor Who. In fact, I think this Disney Plus deal is seen as a supportive component to his overall plan. Hopefully it's part of the overall plan. I really hope that Bob Iger likes Doctor Who, or at least Russell T. Davis. I don't know, maybe this Disney thing's a bad idea. It seems exciting now, but it could be bad. Who knows? What do I think of the Disney Doctor Who deal, Crispy Pro? Your name implies the existence of a crispy amateur. Is there a medium rare pro? <laughs> Just shut, shut up. Well, largely, I think it's awesome. The budget injection is clear to see in the new trailer. I can't believe Unit now has its own Avengers Tower. The scale of the conflict is insane, and it feels like the biggest Doctor Who has ever been. I still have to pinch myself looking at David as 14 with Donna facing the Celestial Toymaker in what looks better than some modern movies. Moffat always complains that it was one of the BBC's biggest flagships, its biggest export next to Top Gear, and they never got money even close to something like a Game of Thrones. That seems to be changing, and that's awesome. You can also feel the budget increase in the guest cast for the specials in Series 14. I mean, Jonathan Groff and Neil Patrick Harris? What is this? The Matrix Resurrections? On the other hand, Disney's all-consuming might over the last 15 years has been awful. Swallowing up 20th Century Fox was a really depressing move that shouldn't have happened, but everyone was too concerned with the possibility of the X-Men in the MCU to notice. Currently, they supposedly don't have any editorial control and are working as a distribution platform for taking Who outside the UK, and I hope it stays that way. The BBC has given up a little bit of its control over Who to do this, and I hope that it doesn't signal that one day they will lose it completely, because that would be a colossal f up. Disney doesn't exactly have the best reputation with putting creatives first, especially when dealing with huge shared universe style franchises, but if anyone has the brass balls to resist the mouse, it's Russell T Davies. Anyway, let's not be negative, we've had enough of that quite frankly, RTD is back and who has never looked more epic. I can't wait and it's so close now. Overall, I think the Disney Plus deal opens up exciting possibilities for Doctor Who's international reach, marketing strategies, budgetary resources, and potential spin-offs. It is so strange seeing Disney Plus share Doctor Who content around. It's a weird universe we live in, but I'm here for it. And I will admit, ever since Disney aligned themselves, I have been seeing a lot more marketing for the show compared to the Moffat and Chibnall years. There were definitely some marketing highlights during those times, don't get me wrong, but it seems like it's more in the general conversation now. I I just feel like the essence of the show will be preserved and that this partnership will contribute positively to the show's future success. Well, are you excited yet? Because I am. We are on the cusp of a truly exciting time for Doctor Who. This is the most excited I've been about Doctor Who in a while, and I'm a fairly optimistic guy that's like enjoyed every season at least. The future of the show was looking very exciting with the return of Russell T Davies giving renewed energy to the series. The proven track record, Davies is under pressure to deliver again, but I feel this expectation only highlights how keen we are that he's back. David Tennant's comeback and subsequent cast as the 14th Doctor were happy accidents, but I'm going to say welcome happy accidents. It could not have come at a better time, and I'm keen to see how things play out. Celebrating the show's 60th anniversary, uh, Tennant's return can give fans something to look forward to, whilst also capitalising on his previous tenure. It's, it's big brain plays. It's a big brain play. I just hope that his presence can satisfy old and new viewers alike, you know? I hope we get some of that Good Omens crowd. Every day on my Twitter, I just see things about Good Omens. Also, the casting of Shudi Gatwa as the 15th Doctor is a stroke of brilliance in my mind. Gatwa's advocacy for the show and his undeniable talent just make him the perfect fit for the role. His portrayal of the Doctor, I have no doubt, will add a lot of energy or Kennedy that will uh, invigorate the show even further. Further. And the Disney Plus deal is another big development that's happening for Doctor Who right now. It really does have the potential to bring Doctor Who back into the general conversation and widen its audience, which I can see as a good thing. It is a risk. It's a gamble. Definitely feels like a big gamble for Doctor Who, but I think it could pay off. I think it definitely could pay off. With all of these elements coming together, it's hard not to be excited for the future of Doctor Who. However, it is important to acknowledge that with this do come high expectations. So will Doctor Who meet these high expectations? But all we can do as eager fans is hope and wait. So thank you for watching The Rise of Doctor Who. Whew, how did how did I do, Jay? Was that alright? It was alright. It wasn't 
long enough, though. That's the main issue I take with it, uh, me personally. Hey, if you liked that video, why not go and show your support by becoming a Patreon or a channel member? I would very much appreciate it. Thank you to all those glorious cameos in this video. All their links can be found in the description. And I hope you all have a very, very good day. Keen for the 60th. Let's go.